so you know, you know, you know who this shot lead is? Is that her? The heavy girl? at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. It is my pleasure to welcome you today as we award degrees to these 2018 Harris graduates. I would like to first introduce Jeremy Edwards, Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs to share some thoughts with our graduates. Jeremy. Okay, a collective deep breath. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Today is truly a special day for the university. Every person in this room in some way has uniquely contributed to the progress and success we celebrate today. We celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates, but we also celebrate the accomplishments of the parents and families in the room with us today that have provided students with the motivation the mentorship, the comfort, and for some of you, the financial support, I know, to allow our graduates the opportunity to thrive during their time here at the University of Chicago. But today we also celebrate the broader Harris community. We've all heard before, it takes a village to raise a child, and I believe in the same way it takes a village to educate the next generation of evidence-based thinkers and leaders. Our faculty teach, and they challenge, and they mentor, and our staff provide the support and services to ensure our students can excel. And our alumni and our friends of the school provide advice and mentorship and guidance. We are all uniquely a part of the recipe. And today, I want to acknowledge and show my personal gratitude to everyone that puts in the extra hours, the extra thought, the extra care and effort to make the student experience at Harris truly meaningful, transformative, and everlasting. So thank you, everyone, for your work. And to the great, yes. <laughs> and to our graduates, graduation is indeed a momentous occasion. It's time 
to celebrate your hard work, your personal and professional growth, and your academic mastery. Today also marks a major transition in your life. As a recipient of a diploma from the University of Chicago, you now carry an obligation forever to be a driver of serious and positive influence in the world. And as a graduate of Harris, many of you, many will look to you for answers. And I can say that you are now prepared to tackle the most complicated and important issues we all face today. If I could offer a few thoughts of advice, it would be, although your education with us ends today, please never stop learning. Be a player in creating the world that you want for yourself. Your training here positions you to do that very thing. I think we've all learned this past year that our assumptions and predictions of all sorts do not always pan out the way that we envision them. The jobs that might excite you today, the people that might inspire you today, the opportunities that might strengthen your career in the future, all of this is unpredictable. And I have found that throughout my own life, the most impactful people are those who have an unquenchable thirst for continued learning, instead of assuming that there's nothing left to discover. Please be willing to try and fail and do it again. All of you are bound together by a profound belief in the possibilities for a better world, not just for yourself, but also for those that you will never meet in person. When your minds are open to learning and listening and working with new people and new ideas and new thoughts, there's no telling what your future will be like. You will solve problems that many will tell you are unsolvable and you will exceed your own expectations and you will do things that will ultimately shock the world. And all of us here on stage and in this room are all so eager and excited to go watch you do that. So I encourage you to leave today fearless and motivated to conquer the problems that demand your attention. We are all so very proud of you and congratulations. The student voice is crucial to who we are here at Harris. It is the most authentic narrative we can offer as a school. And so I'm thrilled to introduce this year's student speaker, Monica Torres Valencia. <laughs> I think she's popular. <laughs> Monica is a master in public policy candidate and co-executive director of the Interpolicy School Summit at the Harris School. She is passionate about food systems and wants to revolutionize the landscape of sustainably produced goods in Mexico. She previously worked with the United Nations Environment Program Office in Mexico and is looking to work on the development of a social enterprise that aims to connect sustainable rural producers in Mexico with consumers interested in ethical and environmentally produced goods. She's also currently interning with the Chicago-based organization Fresh Taste, working on a cultural value change project for Latino communities in the greater Chicagoland area. Monica also majored in biology at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico prior to coming to the Harris School. Please join me in welcoming Monica Torres Valencia. Dear friends, faculty, Harris staff, and loved ones, thank you for being here with us today. I would like for us to think back to the moment when we chose to apply to grad school. What was it that drove us to make that decision? Why was it the right moment to take a chance and study a graduate program? What was it we were hoping to learn? Why did we choose public policy? About 22 months ago, during the first three weeks of classes, my soul was crushed. <laughs> Coming to Harris had become one of the hardest challenges I had ever experienced, and I became really tempted to grab the first plane back home and not come back. I found myself seated in classes where I could barely understand anything after the first 10 minutes into the lecture. 
the workload was intense and the time scarce. For the first time in my life, I was neither the brightest nor the best in class, and I have been put into a position where I needed to ask for help to succeed academically. However, I was not the only one going through this difficult process. In fact, over the course of the program, almost everyone was pulling late night hours and some even sleepless nights. We worked through problem sets, trying to understand whether the demand had to shape upwards or downwards, read long and difficult research papers, spent hours trying to identify where was it that the code went wrong. And all of this, expecting that the number of hours we were investing would hopefully be directly correlated with not failing the class. <laughs> At some point, many of us stopped to wonder, why were we putting ourselves through this? We knew there were other programs out there that were not as challenging or demanding. And still, here we were, trying to understand better how the world works and acquiring the best skills possible to change it. Change the world. That is quite the challenge. But throughout the last 22 months here at Harris, I have met some of the most bright and inspiring people in my life, the perfect candidates to accomplish this change. By choosing to study public policy, we have been given the amazing opportunity and responsibility to dedicate our lives to help raise the voice of the voiceless so that they can be heard. We have been provided with the necessary tools and skills that will allow us to go out into the world, break the status quo, and change things for the better. If there is a common characteristic all of us here today share, is that we see the many injustices in the world, and we want to do everything in our power to change them. When people ask us what we are studying, some of us have experienced the typical reaction. So you want to become a politician. It is a common assumption to make when one, mention, when one mentions public policy school. However, and even when some of our graduates here are on their way to becoming outstanding public servants, it is a diversity of backgrounds and professional goals that make our class so exceptional. We have colleagues who are fighting to end racial injustice and achieve gender equality, who are working for efficient universal health care, who believe in a world where everyone has access to high quality and affordable education, who are experts on energy, fiscal, and financial policy, who are engaged to end inequality and improve economic development, and who are working towards making the world a sustainable place for everyone. Regardless of our policy focus, talent and passion are what I have seen roam the aisles of the Harris School for the past two years. But even the greatest disruptors of our time have had some sort of guidance that led them to achieve their highest potential. We all chose to come to Harris for different reasons, but we are all graduating today carrying that name and title with pride for the rest of our lives. I strongly believe there will be very few moments in our lives where we will have the opportunity to meet as many people at the same time who share very similar, if not the same, interests as us. Being at Harris allowed us the opportunity to learn from and be challenged by some of the greatest minds of our times. We were exposed to so many different cultures that we can now better understand why different people think the way they think and allow for conversation. And conversation is indeed the starting point of good public policy. Here at Harris, we have learned that we should begin this conversation knowing the facts by gathering the necessary data that will allow it to make better and informed decisions. Decisions that change people's lives. And today, we are all going forward in our professional careers, understanding the perfect balance between passion and science. We are now part of change, part of a process for better things to come. 
And we must not forget how is it that we got to this point. It was indeed our hard work and effort that got us here today. But we are part of something bigger. Our families, I am forever grateful to mine for all of the support they have given me. Our mentors, who made time to guide us in the right direction. Our friends, who stayed with us through the toughest of times. And all of the Harris faculty and staff, who work every day to make this school the best source of the next generation of policy leaders. On this day, I would like to remind us that public policy is about hope. The road to doing good and better is not an easy career path and will always be one that requires a substantial amount of effort and hard work. There might be more things we cannot change than things we can. And there will be countless moments when we feel discouraged and ready to give up. But remember, we are all from our very own trench trying to fight the good fight. And even though there will be those who try to stop us, it is our intrinsic passion that will allow us to keep going. What is most comforting about this is the fact that we are not alone. Today, there are 180 of us graduating and 180 of us who have become colleagues, friends, and family. From now on, from now on we have each other to remind us to keep going, to keep dreaming, and to keep moving forward. My dear friends, thank you for everything you have taught me in the last two years. And congratulations. I can't wait to see all the good we will do from our own corners of the world. Thank you. Harris has a long-held tradition. Each year at graduation, we invite an alumna of the school to return and offer a message to our graduates. This year's distinguished alumna speaker is New York State Senator Liz Kruger, a graduate from 1981. First elected to the New York State Senate in a special election in February 2002, Liz Kruger is the ranking Democratic member of the Senate Finance Committee, in addition to serving on six other committees. Senator Kruger has made reforming and modernizing New York State's government, political process, and tax policy the central go goals of her legislative agenda. She is one of New York's most recognized advocates for transformative good government reforms, from overhauling outdated, inadequate campaign finance laws to transforming the opaque state budget process. Senator Kruger is also a strong advocate for tenants' rights, affordable housing, improved access to health care, social services, more equitable funding for public education, including higher education and animal welfare and more. Prior to her election to the Senate, Senator Kruger served for 15 years as the Associate Director of the Community Food Resource Center, where she was responsible for expanding access to government programs for low-income New Yorkers. Before that, she was a founding director of the Food Bank for New York City, where she built that organization into one that now serves an estimated 5.4 million meals each year. Senator Kruger and her husband are here with us today and have been longtime residents of New York City's Eastside community for over 35 years. Please join me in welcoming Senator Liz Kruger. Good afternoon. I'm so glad I came after the student speaker because she was truly inspiring. And I had a flashback to being at University of Chicago from 1979 to 81, because I too found it to be mind crushing and crushing of my soul when I got here. <laughs> I want to thank the administration, the faculty, and of course the students and their families for inviting me to be here with you today. It is quite an honor. I thought I could give you a talk on the cost benefit analysis or zero sum analysis of something I deal with in the state budget. But then I remembered you'd all be much better at that than me. So I thought I would perhaps talk a little bit about how I got from the Harris School to where I am today and why the skills that I 
learned with great pain during my years here have contributed so much to everything that I have done in my life since. I also want to recognize uh, past Professor Malcolm Bush, who was a professor here. We weren't the Harris School there. We were just the Committee on Public Policy then, um, overwhelmed by the economics and business schools. Um, everyone was a conservative then. I su suspect, having read the reviews and the course notes, not everybody's a conservative now. But they were then, and so Malcolm, having started here after being my advisor at Northwestern, where I went undergrad, just up the river a little bit, called and said, you have to come here. One, I need a couple of liberals. Two, you, this is all the things you need to learn. You're scared of math and economics, and you won't self-teach yourself that. So you need to come here, where it will be really hard, but you'll do it and it'll at least give them a couple of liberals to fight with. So I agreed and we, I ended up here. So now, many years later, I'm one of 63 state senators. I've been a senator, as you heard, since 2002. I've been a liberal Democrat for much longer. I have approximately 315,000 constituents and my district runs, if you know New York City at all, from Union Square to 96th Street on the east side. As a liberal who spent 20 years doing anti-poverty work, it's quite the irony that I represent the wealthiest political district in the United States, with more than a few billionaires, many of whom are strongly opinionated and let me know their opinions. This offers daily irony because I keep winning a district that was controlled by Republicans by decade upon decade before I got involved. My district has every kind of major facility. I call it, call it Bed Pan Alley because all the world famous hospitals and medical schools are there. It also includes Museum Mile with the Metropolitan Art and MoMA, to name just two, the Empire State Building, the United Nations with all the consulates, and several Trump Towers and a bunch of Trump family members. <laughs> My constituents include, additional, in addition to the Trumps, uh, Michael Bloomberg, several Koch brothers, endless hedge fund ma uh, managers, but mostly more regular people. A decent number of my constituents like to complain that they vote for me despite my being too liberal for them. But they say they like I am honest, I work hard, and I listen even when they know I will not agree. I like to respond they are living in the greatest city in the world, and they are extremely wealthy. And the fact is, my efforts to marginally raise their taxes and redistribute a little of their wealth is actually good for them. So we continue to have that debate, but they've been voting for me anyway. Um, it's a true honor to be asked to speak here today, especially when considering that in 1979 to 81, as I said, I was, I was a statistical freak. I was a liberal in a sea of conservatives. I was only 20 years old when I entered, a good decade younger than most of the students then. It's a much broader and diverse class now. But then people would do a public policy degree when they'd already done most of their PhD and wanted a little break between their classes and writing their dissertations. Then, maybe it's still true at U of C, there were people in the dorms who were 45 years old. I would say, go out in the world and do something. What are you still doing in school? But that was the rep reputation of University of Chicago and maybe still is. I, I've never quite understood that. Um, and again, as I said, I was a math and economics phobic. Once accepted, I started in the summer before classes started because I needed to take intensive calculus and statistics pre-computers people. <laughs> the professors in these summer classes barely passed me, and I believe one of them said, despite your sincere efforts, I fear you have only mastered spelling the word calculus. <laughs> Oy, I should have just packed it in and run then. But I come from stubborn stock, stock, and we don't step away from a challenge in my family. So the two years of actual classes constantly challenges, challenged and exhausted me. I kept thinking, no disrespect to all the wonderful faculty here, I kept thinking all these professors are much smarter, have bigger vocabularies, lots of letters after their name, but they're wrong. I just have to learn to prove my arguments. At that time, Milton Friedman was a god at this university. And nobody had noticed he had destroyed major countries' economies, but he was a god, and I just kept saying, but it's not working, people. 
So then I left the University of Chicago for the real world. And I said to myself, now I have to unlearn the things I tr they tried to teach me here. But I was wrong, because I have been using the skills I learned here my entire career. When I graduated U of C, Ronald Reagan had just become president. He was cutting federal entitlement programs, but the Midwest was in economic crisis with cars, the steel industry, the rubber industry collapsing. My first job was to help the Cleveland Food Bank and the National Guard distribute a system, excuse me, develop a system to distribute USDA surplus food because Ronald Reagan was cutting the food stamp program, now SNAP, and there was a scandal that the USDA was buying all of the surplus food, putting it in warehouses till it rotted and throwing, away, throwing it away. So Reagan decided he would open the warehouses. No one knew what to do with it. And the priest I was working for at the Cleveland Food Bank said, you have a smart degree from University of Chicago. Figure out how we set up a six-state distribution system for this food. Well, I hadn't studied any of that at U of C, but in fact, I got to work, and we did. We set up a system, and the Teamsters were my truckers, and the National Guard were my soldiers, and we moved food from the warehouses to hundreds of emergency food sites throughout the six mid Midwestern states which were suffering from so much, such a high unemployment rate, about a 25% unemployment rate at that time. From there, I wanted to move back to New York City, and I was intending to. And there was a group who was trying to start a food bank for New York City, but they had not been successful. So they got me to try and give it a shot to start the food bank in the South Bronx. It is now the largest in the country, and just to correct the statistic, it now serves over 62 million meals every year to low-income New Yorkers. And there are food banks throughout the country. In fact, I believe one of the original ones was here in Chicago. Even though I hated the fact that U of C made me take accounting and budgeting, turns out I really needed that skill to set up the books for my new not-for-profit, to track inventory in and out, the warehouse, and to track if I could make payroll, which I could not all the time in the beginning. I learned what to do with donations of whole frozen goats, and I learned to hotwire and drive forklift vehicles. I believe I'm still the only state senator, perhaps in the country, who on the side can load and unload semi-tractors semi with a forklift. I haven't really reviewed, but I'm the only one in New York. I actually had to help, I actually had help starting the New York City Food Bank from organized crime because the local nuns in the South Bronx, Bronx guilt tripped the mob affiliated carting companies and truckers into helping me. The nuns would explain she's doing God's work, you need brownie points, help her. <laughs> And they did, um, and oddly enough, I am greatly appreciative of all the work they did for me back then. It was a little unusual, but I'd already dealt with the National Guard, so then we moved on to the mob. <laughs> a few years later, I moved into a policy advocacy organization, working on a range of anti-poverty programs and efforts, developing and running model direct service programs, evaluating federal, state, and city benefit programs, advocating for government to do better. I spent nearly 20 years trying to get the government to move in the right direction and was also involved in many class action lawsuits trying to make them follow the law. Lots of numbers crunching and analysis for being expert witness in court. Thank you, University of Chicago, for teaching me how to do numbers crunching tech analysis because we won many of those lawsuits. Sidebar, I had actually written my thesis here. Do you still have to write a thesis? No. Well, we did then. So I wrote my. Th <laughs> I had to write my. Th I wrote my thesis on how Richard Nixon's negative income tax was pro proposal was far superior to most federal welfare programs implemented before or after his presidency. Now we know Richard Nixon's role in history, but he actually had some very progressive policy ideas. His son-in-law is actually the head of the New York State Republican Party now, and I've told him that his father-in-law, while a flawed human being, had many excellent ideas. I've also told him that if he was alive today, the Republican Party would probably tell Richard Nixon he was a Democrat and throw him out the door. Shifting to politics. In March 2000, I was asked to run for the New York State Senate which has been controlled by Republicans since 1939. 
There was a big push to ride Al Gore's coattails into the White House. Anybody remember that one? It didn't work out exactly that way. And to shift the New York Senate from red to blue. I had to be drafted against my will. That my district had a 32 year popular Republican incumbent, and most people just laughed when I was considering running. Even the Democratic le leaders in my neck of the woods said I was too liberal for this territory and should move to the Upper West Side, Chelsea, or the Village. If you're a New Yorker, you know what I'm talking about. I made a list of 29 reasons I should not run for the State Senate and asked them to try to convince me that I was wrong. They really couldn't answer the questions. I hired a polling firm to do a feasibility poll. And when they did it, they wanted to revisit my fear of regression analysis, thank you, U of C, and sit there and explain to me for three hours all the sub runs and what they each meant. I said, I have no time to relearn statistics. I was never good at it. If this was a horse race, what would my odds be? They fought me, but eventually they said 20%. I said, so I only need 31% more? Not bad. They said, when you're at 20%, you don't run. <laughs> I decided to run. <laughs> the incumbent who had had the New York Times endorsement for every two years for 32 years outspent me five to one, and only really about half of my family and friends thought that somehow I could do this. My husband, John Seely, is with me here today, and he was always in my corner. On election night, we tied in the machines, and there was a six and a half week recount of the paper ballots. Ultimately, the day before Christmas, I was declared the loser by 123 votes out of 127,000 cast. You do the math at what a small percentage I lost by. But the incumbent dropped out midterm. He was told that I would kill him in the next election, and they wanted to beat me with a special election midterm. So they had a special election, and I won. And only after I took my seat in the New York State Senate did I learn that they actually had known I won the first time also, because there had been four boxes of paper ballots that were stolen and hidden in the drop ceiling of the election office. Nothing was done at that time. Frankly, by the time I learned it, I was already a senator. There was nothing that could be done. But it did lead to a pretty good episode of law and order. <laughs> they had to add a murder of someone who discovered the election fraud, because they always have a murder. In real life, there was no murder. We just moved on. But you still can see the story in reruns, because law and order will be with us for the rest of our lives. <sighs> what I've learned while a senator, which I think is true for almost anything that really matters in life, stay true to your beliefs. Don't be intimidated. Don't think the other person knows more. There is a bill that some people have been trying to get passed in New York State for years that I keep fighting, which would allow motorcycle riders to ride without their helmets. And usually, the, because it's state option, not federal law. And the motorcycle riders who usually want this option are the ones who sort of look like they're members of the Hells Angels, even if they're not. The long hair that they want to flow in the wind and the dark leather jackets, and they try to be very intimidating looking. And they kept approaching me, trying to get me to change my mind on the vote. So finally, I sat down with them and I said, you know, if you will change your bill with one sentence, I could support your bill. Because my real concern is that you get into terrible accidents, you end up with brain damage and spinal cord injury, and the government has to pay your health care for the rest of your life. So if you change your bill, I think I could support it. So they said, what do you want us to change? I said, guarantee you'll die on impact. <laughs> they never came to lobby me again. <laughs> Just saying. The cigarette companies also came to visit. They were concerned about some anti-smoking and anti-tobacco laws I was carrying. And they came and they sat down. They came from one of the southern states where they grow tobacco. New York is not a tobacco state. And they just sat there. And they didn't start to say anything. And I said, well, usually when people lobby me, they have something they want to tell me. What is it you want to tell me? Oh, nothing, Senator. We just want to be a resource for you and answer your questions. Hmm. Why do you kill people for a living? <laughs> Excuse me? 
You said you want to answer my questions. Seems to me, as a business model, killing your clients isn't very smart. You have to keep getting new ones. Why don't you come up with something to sell that doesn't kill me? Because in fact, you're very good at marketing. You get people to buy things they know are going to kill them. Why don't you just come up with products that don't kill, but kill us? And they said, well, we have chewing tobacco too. I said, nah, that kills you also, just in a different way. They said, anything else? I go, no, I'm done. Do you have anything else? They said, no. I said, goodbye, go back, fly back to the south. Don't bother me anymore. I faced a lot of challenges on the floor of the New York State Senate. I've been called un-American for supporting the Constitution. I'm a strong and ardent fighter for reproductive health for women. And even just this week, I had a fight and it took me three days just to get the right to speak on abortion issues as a hostile amendment on the floor of the Senate. Again, Republican-controlled Senate, just to be a little partisan. Finally, on the third day, they'd agreed they were going to let the procedural process go through. So I started out by saying that they'd spent a couple of days mansplaining to prevent me from taking the floor, which only made them look worse. And since New York State was so behind on its policies, it just continued to strengthen my argument when they would do things like this. I lost the vote, but I'll never give up the fight. After the multiple day fight, a few of my colleagues behind the scenes off the floor um, chided me for using the word mansplain. They actually didn't know what it meant, meant, so I told them to Google it, and then we could have the fight. So they said they were offended. I said, no, it is I who am offended, not you. They said it was unfair for me to imply they were being too tough on women, since they and I knew that I could take whatever they hit me with and hit back harder. I agreed, and we all laughed. Then I reminded them that they should really try taking baby steps into the 21st century, reminding them all that a few years ago when I passed a law to protect a woman's right to breastfeed, they made me re remove the word nipple from the definition section of the bill. I was like, really, men, you have completely lost track of time and place and reality, and you need to move on and do something else with your life. <laughs> a few years ago, I perhaps had my greatest victory on the floor of the New York State Senate because I ended up in a John Stewart segment with his making fun of me. And my best friend said, you might as well just go home and die now because there's nothing more you can accomplish in life than being parodied by Jon Stewart on The Daily Show. And the storyline goes like this. The Republicans continue to put page after page after page of ridiculous, meaningless bills on the floor and no serious substantive bills, whether I agreed with them or didn't agree with them. And I am known to be the serious debater for the Democrats. And I went to them and I said, I'm going to debate every single one of these bills until you start getting serious about what we're supposed to be doing here. And I think there was about 24 bills on the agenda that day. And I could uh, pull off, uh, under parliamentary procedure, a two-hour debate on each. So I said, get ready, because you know I can stand there forever and I can debate a brick wall. So they left, and they came back, and there was only one bill on the agenda. They said, there's only one bill left. We dare you to debate it. And the bill was whether yogurt should be the official New York State snack. <laughs> so we debated. I pointed out, did they mean only New York made yogurt? Did they mean that it was a snack but not a breakfast food? Was it no longer a breakfast food? What about lactose intolerant people? It, we were also honoring Korean American Day that day by coincidence. I said, the Korean American community is disproportionately lactose intolerant. What about them? Well, there's soy-based yogurt. I said, I've tried soy-based yogurt. It's disgusting. Have you tried it? <laughs> that cannot be the New York State snack. We went on and on and on and picked up by Jon Stewart, so thank you very much. <laughs> All that math, accounting, budgeting, and economics at U of C really has come in handy for the real work I do as well, particularly on the Finance Committee. And I am hoping to be the first Democratic chair of the New York State 
Finance Committee when we take over with any luck next January. We still, I still don't know how to balance my checkbook, but my husband tells me I can only deal with billions and our personal accounts don't have enough zeros. <laughs> but in order to deal with the billion, which New York State's budget is about 170 billion per year now, it involves critical thinking and research skills, which are sorely missed by so many legislators who make up the majority of my colleagues. They didn't get to go to the University of Chicago Public Policy School. So we are dependent on quality staff to help us research and write legislation. So even if you're not sure you would want to go into politics, I heard before some of you do, there are lots of roles you can play. How m of course, you may end up in a state capital. How many of you have been to Springfield since you've been living here in Chicago? One, two, four. Yeah, I did a little work there too. Well, Albany, New York, not so different than Springfield. You desperately want to get back to Chicago or New York City, I understand. And yet, critical work happens in all 50 state capitals. I'm just, I think I'm going on a little too long, so I just want to close by saying, New York is known as one of the most dysfunctional legislatures in the country. We have a governor who cares too much about his own ego and seems to go out of his way to hurt New York City because he hates the mayor there. The heads of both of our legislative bodies, the Senate and the Assembly, have recently been found guilty of bribery and fraud and are heading to jail. And they are the only, latest, only the latest convicted legislators since I took office. And New York looks like a well-oiled machine compared to Washington right now. And the story is similar in other state capitals. Actually, sidebar, the press corps voted me the least likely to be indicted in Albany. <laughs> I was wondering whether that would be good on my tombstone, but in fact, I was really hoping for more in life than just least likely to be indicted. But I will tell you that when you do win in politics, in government, great things can happen. You can impact in New York State what happens for 20 million Americans. When the bigger states all move the same kinds of progressive legislation, the federal government usually says, damn, I guess we have to do something now. So you can be impacting 300 million Americans. You can be impacting their daily lives. You can be impacting their children, their grandchildren, the environment, the future of the planet. And you can also stop bad things from happening, which is underestimated in public policy, because pendulums swing both ways. So you can be a voice and a participant in accomplishing good, but you can also be a voice and participant in stopping much worse from happening, and never underestimate that as valuable in your future careers. So even when you lose fights, you win. And if the good guys stop showing up for work, the bad guys will just take our places. So I hope that amidst the chaos and corruption of real world politics, you too can have a rewarding and meaningful life getting involved with your public policy degrees and all your smarts and all your goals. When you are reading the news, I am trying hopefully to make good news. It is not all fun, but coming from University of Chicago, you understand that all too well. I never know that this school was called where fun comes to die. I don't think we had that line 40 years ago. But when you're ready to run for office, give me a call. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Kruger. I now call upon Dean Katherine Baker and the designated faculty and staff who are here to assist with the presentation of the truth today. Dean Baker, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Arts by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Masters of Arts, and I express the hope that your work will improve our understanding of public policy. Congratulations.
Misha J. Grammar Plus. Amir Hussein. Takahiro Ono. <laughs> Dean Baker, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. They have been awarded the degree of Master's the trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Masters of Science, and I express the hope that your work will improve our understanding of public policy. Congratulations. Tito Sulistio Adikusumo. Faraz Ahmad. <laughs> Ari Anisfeld. <laughs> Pedro Amengol Pedrosa. Juan Alberto Arroyo Miranda. <laughs> Colette Dunya Saad Ashley. <laughs> Ran B. Camila Carrasco. <laughs> Singsi Chung. <laughs> Alyssa Suzanne Cox. Jasmine Romero Dial. <laughs> Xing Ding. <laughs> Ratul Esrar. Young Flora Fu. Ibrahim <laughs> Gaver. G <laughs> Ye. <laughs> Hannes Kinnig. Sunju Lee <laughs> Dylan Madden <laughs> Andrew Mao <laughs> Shambhavi Muhan
Sarah Palmisano. Emma Cooper Peterson. Haley Prohl. Mark David Vandergon. Victor Vilches Teya. Joanne Wang. Regina Wijaya. UC Wu. Wejia Sheen. Andrew Yaspin. Leping Tommy Yu. Menja Ju. Caitlin Zoltan. Dean Baker, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. They have been awarded the degree of Masters of Public Policy by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the, the degree of Masters of Public Policy, and I express the hope that your work will guide public policy towards the enhancement of public good. Congratulations. James Samuel Abbott. <laughs> Michael Abrahamson. <laughs> Juliana Aguilar Restrepo. Sayeb Abdullah Asin. <laughs> Yuli Almoslino. <laughs> Mark Arcus. Adriana Artola. <laughs> Tianyun Bai. <laughs> Tyler Daniel Barron. <laughs> Daniela Bergman Soto. Jaspal Singh Bhatia. <laughs> Divya Bhatnagur. <laughs> Sarah.
Sarah Ann Boyle. Myra Alejandra Cabrera. Andres Celis. Meghna Chandra. Yijun Chen. Sarah Chung. Jack Coglin. Charles Herbert Crother. Thomas Patrick Curran III. Himanshu Dave. Dolores de Iturbe. Carla Valerie de la Fuente Rodriguez. Lucia Delgado Sanchez. Maria Diego Fernandez Forsek. Yahuen Ding. Anna Shields Draft. Magali Duarte Urquhart. Gerardo Engaña. Uranbeleg Inktushin. Abigail Ann Eskenazi. Michael Falk. Yushin Fu. Samuel Mincer Fuchs. Annie Shinyu Gao. Eduardo Garcia Bejos. Isidoro Garcia Urquieta. Gustavo Hill. Ilana Goldstein. Yeah. 
Daniela Melissa Gomez Trevino. Soon Chin Gu. Anne Lauren Gunderson. <laughs> Rodrigo Guzman Sanchez. Max Christopher Hamrick. Yi Ran Hao. Bo Frank Harrison. Bin Bin Hua. Zach Hua Itao. Madeline Mary Hinkamp. Yi Hu Matthew Russell Jacobson Ji Hei Jung Gracelyn Rita Jennings Newhouse. Jessica Jiang. Elena Jimenez. <laughs> Jennifer Joe. <laughs> Changwook Ju. Zainab Kavachi. <laughs> Daniel Martin Kraus. <laughs> so young Tiffany Kwok. Jamie Cheyoung Kwan. (laughs) 
Matthew Bruce LaFond. Haven Christina Leeming. Trista Lee. Pedro Liedo Osoko. Michael Dean Lindemulder. Li Jong Liu. Xiao Fan Liu. Yuan Long Liu. Alejandra Lopez Rodriguez. Luchin Lua. Andrea Megania. <laughs> Sofia Rosa Manuel. <laughs> Renee Alejandro Maya Garcia. Laura Ann McFadden. <laughs> Luis Me Gerardo Mejia Sanchez. <laughs> Rhythma Misra. Kieran Misra. Sarah Meredith Nixon. Takuji Miyagi. Takanori Miyazato. <laughs> Christian Matthew Myers. <laughs> Muhammad Umir Naim. Christine Ursula Napo. Oop. <laughs> Gustavo Francisco Novoa. <laughs> Guillermo Ortiz Ibarola. Bruno Eduardo Osorio Hernandez. <laughs> Sally Jison Park. <laughs> Lina Rocio Pedraza Peña. Oliver Manuel Peña Habib. <laughs> Rochen Chio. Jorge Eduardo Quintero Corral.
Claudia Patricia Quintero Saleg. Diviasha Ray. Arturo Rocha. Flavia Giania Sacco Capuro. Toru Sakurai. Tanya Evelyn Sanchez Hernandez. Joao Andre Saroli. Li Ming Shen. Yusuf Shukri. Vicky Stavropoulos. <laughs> Zi Hao Su. <laughs> Shruti Subramanyam. Mohammed Tabub. <laughs> Shinya Takatani. Monica Andrea Torres Valencia. Madeline Marie Toops. <laughs> Maria Paula Valderrama Rueda. <laughs> Stephen James Walker. <laughs> Manyi Wong. Yuanzu Wang. <laughs> Jie Cheng Wei. <laughs> Mora Detmer Welch. <laughs> Wu Bo. Menua Wu. <laughs> Sahi Wu. <laughs> Zinner Zhu. <laughs> Yosuke Yamasita. Masayuki Yanagi. <laughs> D. Young. <laughs> Yuki Yasarani. <laughs> Nancy Zamudio Gomez. Dong Zhang. <laughs> Liang Zhang.
Ling Fei Zhang. Zhang Xuan. Xin Yuan Zhang. Shuhan Zhou. Xiaoqin Zhu. Dean Baker, the students I now present have attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On, the, on behalf of the faculty of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy as confirmed by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, and I welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Congratulations. Bokar Ba. Jennifer Lynn Gandhi. Marcela Neyman Leon. <laughs> Tong Wong. to introduce Dean Catherine Baker to make closing remarks. Class of 2018 Harris graduates, congratulations. Well done. just a day of celebration. It's a time to look forward to the amazing work that you're going to do and the challenges that you're going to face. It's a time for reflection on all that you've accomplished and a time to be grateful for all of the people who have helped you. Parents, siblings, grandparents, spouses, friends, neighbors, delivery people, they all deserve a round of applause as well.
today is a special day as we welcome a new class of Harris alumni to our family. It's an exceptional community of alumni. You've heard from our future alumna, from our distinguished alumna, and there's some common threads that are really heartwarming to hear from the fact that despite the fact that statistics is very challenging, it comes in handy, to the fact that you'll have to rely on the deep well of passion that brought you here to get you through the challenges that you're going to face as you go out and try to make the world a better place. You're leading the way for public policy in a world that depends on rigorous inquiry, on evidence-based approaches, on wrestling with difficult issues to really make a difference, and that's the Harris way. In my first year as dean, I've been struck by the university's devotion to those principles. Our approach and our values really set us apart, and that's why you came to Harris. You came to Harris because you shared our dedication to that approach, because we all believe that the toolkit that you have worked so hard to acquire is vitally needed to make better policy and to make better lives for people around the world. No matter what challenge you face, whether you go on to become a minister of finance, a community organizer, lead a nonprofit, or start a social enterprise, the core values and the core mission that we all share, the commitment to inquiry, to evidence, to bringing truth to bear on difficult questions, that will continue to serve you well. This year I've been struck not only by that shared dedication, but also by the energy and vibrancy of our students. You embody the best of Harris, and you give me hope that despite the challenging world that I know you're going into, you're going to be able to make that difference that we are all relying on. Yours has not been an easy journey. You've been challenged by your classes, your faculty, and your classmates, and I commend you on rising to meet that challenge. It's now up to you to make the most of all of that hard work, all of that dedication, the most of your Harris education. And we have very high expectations, young people, and we expect you to meet them. It may seem like these are particularly challenging times for leaders and scholars who are dedicated to evidence-based policy making, to analytical approaches, but your work has never been more important. The world may be more complicated, it may be harder to find solutions, but we have much better tools than we've ever had in the past. New methods, new approaches, innovative policies that you've learned about here and that you've come up with on your own, and it's that innovation that's going to drive us forward. The skills you've acquired and the dedication you bring to your work have clearly well equipped you to meet those challenges. As you reflect back on your time here, from your first day at math camp, when you probably asked yourself, what exactly have I gotten myself into, and is it too late to go home? And the answer, yes, it is too late. You're here now. <laughs> <laughs> to the hours you spent on daunting problem sets, you can be confident that Harris has prepared you for the world that needs you. And don't worry, when you open up your diploma, there's not a sneaky problem set hidden in the back. You are all done with your Harris problem sets. So congratulations to all of you on all that you've accomplished already and to the bright future that lies in front of you. You did it. You're Harris alumni. You're alumni of the University of Chicago. As you embark on this new phase of your life, remember what you learned here. Remember the connections you made to your classmates, to the community of scholars that you've joined, and the commitment you developed to bringing that rigorous evidence-based approach to all of the problems that you're going to encounter in an evolving world. You're the future of public policy, and you have the power to change the world. We couldn't be more proud to call you Harris alumni. Congratulations. This concludes the official part of the ceremonies. Please remain seated until all of the graduates and faculty party formally process out of the theater. Afterwards, I invite you to join us for a reception in the courtyard just outside. I hope you will stay with us to enjoy this special day. Again, thank you very much, and especially congratulations to our graduates.